welcome to Game of Thrones Season 5 Crammed. Often considered the worst of a bunch despite having some real diamonds in the rough. Thanks for all the feedback, let's go. It's flashback time and a young Cersei bullies a woods witch into telling her fortune. And it's not great. This hag foretells her betrothal to King Robert and the death of her incest children, and that she'll eventually be replaced by a younger and prettier queen. So back to modern day and Jaime stands vigil over Tywin's body in the Great Sept of Baelor, mulling over the results of releasing Tyrion. And at the royal wake it seems that cousin Lancel Lannister has joined a religious group called the Sparrows. He's been going to confession a lot lately and Cersei doesn't like that at all. What with them banging and him helping to get King Robert killed. Her husband-to-be, Sir Loras, and his boy Toy are interrupted by Marjorie, and the general feeling is that anyone can do whatever they want now that the Lannister Lord is dead. The drunk dwarf loot crate arrives in Pentos at Aurelio's mansion. Varys wants the Targaryens restored to power because Westeros is a mess, but Tyrion is not at his finest and has developed a drinking problem. He's a wreck after killing his father, but Varys argues for him to go to Marine and help make a true ruler out of Danny. So on the road to Volantis, they drink and annoy each other as best they can. Danny, in turn, is continuing to make Marine her own city, but the truth is a resistance movement called the Sons of the Harpy are starting to murder her men. So Daenerys and her unsullied prepare to fight a shadow war. Dario and her envoy have returned from Yunkai, where they've consented to a peaceful council to rule. Slavery is out, but they would like the fighting pits reopened. Dario agrees with the idea, who has a history of pit fighting himself, and counsels Danny to show strength and free her dragons. But they're the unaddressed problem, and they've been getting bigger and wilder in the pit, and Danny loses confidence over what to do. Up at the wall, John drills for men hard, and Stannis is currently occupying Castle Black alongside the Watch. He wants the wildlings to join his own army or burn for Melisandre, and it's down to John to convince Mance Raider, their king. But the king beyond the wall won't force his own people to fight and die for anyone, even when he discovers he'll be burnt alive. And with the choice made, Mel can't wait to get cooking. It's a bad way to go, and for the sake of knowing the man he was, John puts Mance out of his agony. In the Vale, Littlefinger is ruling via Robin the Weakling, and Brienne is in a foul mood ever since losing Arya. Oddly, she has no idea Sansa is just over there with Littlefinger as he takes her on a secret mission. Podrick recognises them in a tavern, and Brienne tries to swear herself to protect Sansa for her mother's sake. But she gets laughed off, and Sansa doesn't want anything to do with her. They beat a hasty retreat and kill some men, but despite being mugged off by both of the Stark girls now, Brienne decides to tail Sansa for her own safety. Arya reaches the City of Bravos to start her new career, and is taken far past the bustling docks to the House of Black and White. She's refused entry at the door, but after living rough and camping out for a day or two, Jack and Hagar reveals himself as being no one, and she's admitted in. With Oberyn Martell dead, the rest of Dawn is sending threats. And Cersei worries about Marcella's safety. Jaime plans to go in secret to get their daughter back, taking Bronn with him, who's currently working out which of his wife's family need to be killed in order for him to inherit Stokeworth. Jaime can sort him an even better married position, however, if he comes to Dawn. Meanwhile, Prince Duran Martell, ruler of Dawn, is besieged by his dead brother's paramour for vengeance, including killing Marcella. But Duran's not into murdering innocents, and the people are unhappy. Dario helps the Unsullied investigate into the Sons of the Harpy, and there's contention about how hard to go on their new prisoner. Danny won't execute without a trial, but the Harpy Man is killed by scared former slaves, and a riot kicks off between the freed men and the former masters. Drogon pops over for a visit, but Danny isn't the confident woman she used to be, and he can sense this in her. Cersei has a word out that she's paying for dwarf heads, which is leading to a lot of innocent killings, and she decides to sit in charge of things on a small council, naming Kyburn her new Master of Whispers. Tywin's brother, Uncle Kevin, is not in interested in being her puppet, however, and goes home. Stannis is angry at Jon for showing mercy to Mance, and up at the watch, Alistair Fawn is likely to be elected the new Lord Commander, which will make Jon's life a misery. Stannis wants Jon to join him and become a Stark instead of a Snow, inheriting the North as Lord of Winterfell, but Jon will not forswear his oath. So at the election, Sam Tarly finds his voice and speaks up about the brave deeds Jon committed as he led up to leading the defence of the Wall. But he's also loved a wildling, and the count against him and Fawn breaks even, until Master Aemon casts the deciding vote to make Jon Lord Commander. Over in the House of Black and White, Arya works as a temple apprentice where people come to worship their gods and die. She wants to learn all of the cool secrets, but Jack and Hagar is drilling her on the basics, and the fact that all gods are just a variation on death itself. If she's to become no one, she'll need to give up her former possessions, which she duly does with the exception of Needle that she hides instead. 
so she's led down to the next level of the temple where she and her new bully tend to the dead. In King's Landing, it's third time lucky as Marjorie weds and beds a young King Tommen, and she wastes no time in turning him against his mother, Cersei. So Tommen innocently suggests that she might want to retire back to Casterly Rock, and the Queen Regent is not happy. The Boltons are ruling the north from Winterfell where Ramsay's still flaying people and torturing Reek. His father Roose, it turns out, has been conspiring with Littlefinger, who's planning on marrying Sansa off to Ramsay to help secure the north. She's not impressed. Again. But Littlefinger has a way of convincing people to do what he wants, making it seem like it's their choice. So she plays nice to Roose and meets Ramsay, despite his psycho girlfriend, while Baelish and Bolton size each other up as possible allies. Brienne and Podrick are still stalking after her, while she shares her history of being ridiculed for being a big lass. But she's a big lass now who can fight, and she plans on killing Stannis in revenge for Renly. Up on the wall, Lord Commander Snow declines again Stannis' offer as being reinstated as a Stark of Winterfell. Stannis sees much in Jon, and Davos takes a moment to remind him that the North will suffer for as long as the Boltons are ruling. Being Lord Commander is a thankless task, but despite their hate for each other, Jon praises Alistair Fawn's skills and experience to name him First Ranger, instead of just sending him far away now that he's in charge. Scumbag Janos Slint, however, refuses Jon's orders to his face, so the boy must prove he's a man and take Slint's head for mutiny and Stannis likes it. Back in the capital, that religious group of sparrows drag the sinful High Septon out of a brothel and make him take the walk of shame. The small council is mildly amused, but Cersei decides to visit the High Sparrow who leads these new religious zealots to see what's going on. Turns out this guy's for real, deeply religious and possessing nothing and treating everyone as equal. Cersei can see the power that he has over the small folk, however, and suggests that the crown and the faith work together. Meanwhile, Pycelle is still working on some serious Frankenstein shit for her on the side. Tyrion and Varys make it to the city of Volantis, famous for its slaves of every caste, including red priests who are all for Daenerys Targaryen. It's time to visit some whores, and although Tyrion still knows how to charm them, he realises he's just not into that anymore. No matter though, because in the middle of a piss he's captured by Sir Jorah Mormont, who plans on taking him to Danny. Mormont steals stroke pays for a boat and bundles up his hostage for a trip to Marine. Jorah hopes that bringing a Lannister hostage like Tyrion over to Danny will earn her forgiveness, and Tyrion is amused to find out he's being kidnapped to the very same place he was trying to get to anyway. Jamie and Bronn sail to Dawn on their secret mission to rescue Princess Marcella and row to shore in the dead of night. They're discovered first thing, but Bronn does what he does best and Jamie uses his golden hand special technique to finish off the attack. Elaria and the Sand Snakes, other daughters of the Oberyn Martell who got his head popped in King's Landing, know that Jamie is in town, and they plan to kill Marcella before she's rescued in order to throw the country into war. The Iron Bank is pressuring the Iron Throne to pay back its debts, so Sir Cersei is sending Mace Tyrell, the Master of Coin, over to Bravos to negotiate better terms. And seeing that he's basically a joke, she's also sending Sir Merin Trant to keep an eye on things. Cersei continues her process of removing the Tyrells from power by next allowing the High Sparrow to reinstate an ancient religious military order of zealots who love gay bashing and now have the authority to imprison Sir Loras. Marjorie is furious and poor Tommen is clueless, so he goes to talk to the High Septon about the Faith Militant but gets really bad vibes at the Sept entry and achieves nothing. Stannis is planning on attacking Winterfell with his army and Melisandre suggests that she come with him to battle this time in order to avoid a repeat of Blackwater Bay. She then offers to have sex with Jon, who refuses, but she knows she's made it into his wank bank. In fact, the Red Woman wants Stannis' mad wife and his sweet daughter to march with them too, because there's power in royal blood. And despite being cold and humorless, Stannis does love his daughter. Littlefinger knows it's not going to be long before Stannis takes Winterfell and rescues Sansa from the Boltons. So for now he's going to leave her there and return to the capital to pretend that he's still working for the Lannisters. So Barristan tells Danny about the good old days and her other, better brother, Rhaegar, but the people are still beseeching her to reopen the fighting pits, while in the streets the Sons of the Harpy continue their shadow war, killing freedmen and unsullied. The attacks are worse every day, but Sir Barristan the Bold smells trouble and steps in to have Grey Worm's back. It's a desperate fight and both men go down in defence of each other. While Missandre watches over an alcomatose Grey Worm, Danny laments the death of her brave knight and then has the leaders of all of the noble houses rounded up to meet her dragons in order to explain that she's had enough of their shit. On the wall, Maester Aemon laments the idea of a Targaryen queen a world away without allies, and tells Jon that being Lord Commander means making hard choices. You see, Jon wants to get Tormund to go north and convince all of the remaining wildlings to make peace and come south of the wall. This is because if they die in the north, they'll simply make the undead army of the others larger and stronger, when instead they could be on the side of the living, helping to defend the realms of men. This does not 
not go down very well with the rest of the Night's Watch who've been fighting the wildlings for generations, including those who'd recently lost families in Mance Raider's attack. Although Gilly is still just wide-eyed over Sam for knowing about the wider world and being able to read books, Stannis prepares to head out with his family to fight the Boltons and agrees to lend Jon some ships to transport the wildlings down from north of the Wall before he marches out for war. In Winterfell, Ramsay's crazy girlfriend is jealous of him marrying Sansa, but they work it out over some kind of hate sex? And she goes to show Sansa where Reek is being kept with the dogs. Ramsay makes a show of having broken the former Theon over dinner and has him apologise for killing her brothers. It's super awkward and weird, and worse when Roose announces his fray wife Walder is going to have a baby, essentially knocking Ramsay out of line from inheriting the North. Gutted, mate. Grey Worm pulls through, and Danny realises she needs to change her tactics if she hopes to rule a peaceful city. She decides not to feed all of the nobles to the dragons and instead marry one of them in order to secure her rule in line of an ancient family. While on their way over, Tyrion tries to explain to Sir Jorah that as an alcoholic he'd really like some wine. While the route they are taking involves the ruined city of Valeria, where they spy Drogon flying far afield. But in the doomed city they are attacked by stonemen, petrified zombie people in the final stages of grayscale that are banished there to die. They fight them off and nearly drown for their troubles before washing up ashore with a long way yet to go. Sadly one of them managed to scratch Sir Jorah and he quietly knows that his days are now numbered. Arya continues to prepare the dead as an acolyte in the Temple of Black and White, and starts to learn the subtle art of reading faces to detect lies and truths, as well as controlling her own features to lie more convincingly. She helps some people to accept death from the poison fountain, and is accepted herself into another level of a temple. The huge chamber where they store the faces of all the dead. Although not yet ready to be a faceless man, she is ready to assume different identities by more traditional means in service of a many-faced god. Tyrion tells Jorah about killing his own father Tywin, and also that Jorah's own father, Commander Mormont, was killed north of the Wall. They're captured by slavers heading in the wrong direction, but seeing as Danny has reopened her fighting pits in a bid to win over her people, Tyrion convinces them that Jorah is a great warrior and worth a lot more if sold in Marine. Also that a dwarf's cock is worth some good money, so they better take him too. Peter Baelish returns to King's Landing to find his brothels have all been cleared out by the Faith Militant, and he goes to meet with Cersei to try to understand why she's a allowed them back into power. Cersei just wants to know if he's won the armies of the Vale over to her side yet, but even juicier, Littlefinger says the Boltons have betrayed her and are harbouring Sansa in secret in order to kill the Lannister-Bolton alliance. Olena Tyrell also returns to the capital in outrage over the incarceration of her grandson, Sir Loras. He's going to be tried by the Faith under the charges of being gay, which nobody was really bothered about until the church suddenly became really powerful. Cersei loves how she's not directly responsible, and how even the Queen can be questioned under Holy Inquest. In fact, for backing up her own brother and lying in court, Queen Marjorie is also imprisoned by the Faith, and King Tommen manages to do nothing about it. Over a bath, Ramsay's crazy girlfriend tells Sansa all about the different girls he's hunted down with the dogs. But Sansa doesn't show any fear and tells her to fuck off. It's time for the wedding, and in the godswood, Reek is dressed up as Fionn again to give Sansa away. That night, however, Sansa realises just how much of a mistake she's made in agreeing to marry Ramsay. He strips her down and makes Reek watch as he gets so rapey! Oh Jesus, that's not cool, come on. Oh no, that's weirdly worse. Down in the water gardens of Dawn, Princess Marcella is getting along very well with Princess Tristane, and they can't wait to get married. Prince Duran is trying to keep her safe from the Sand Snakes in an attempt to maintain peace, but they make their assassination attempt at the very same time Jamie and Bronn sneak in. So some kind of confused fighting breaks out and everybody is arrested. On the wall, most of the brothers of the Watch are at best insulted and at worst borderline mutinous at the very idea of Jon working with Tormund to fetch the remaining wildlings and offer them safe haven. Sam and Gilly look after a suddenly ailing Maester Aemon who recalls his childhood fondly before passing away. Over his funeral pyre, Sam wonders if he has any friends left in the Watch. And it doesn't seem he has many because he's beaten whilst trying to defend Gilly from getting raped by scumbags, but at least Ghost still has his back and later that night Gilly takes his V-card. Reek brings a bruised, raped and beaten Sansa some breakfast, so yay, and explains to her that with Ramsay it can always be worse. She tries to shake some of the old Fionn back into him and signal to Brienne for help, but he's too broken and Brienne's watch continues outside the walls. Ramsay then flays an old woman who'd offered Sansa some help earlier just to let
let her know what kind of monster he is. There's a snowstorm that's kicked in while Stannis is marching toward Winterfell, and for the moment the army is stuck. Davos suggests returning to Castle Black, but Stannis will only go forward. Melisandre has seen visions that imply they'll win, but the storm must pass, and that requires sacrifice. So Jorah and Tyrion are sold by the slavers to enter into the fighting pits of Marine, and Danny explains to Dario that she needs to marry his star for political reasons, despite enjoying him more during the evenings. Dario urges her to use the wedding as an opportunity to slaughter all of the wise masters that oppose her, but she is pursuing a more political route instead. So on the day that she has the fighting pits reopened as part of her marriage negotiations, Sir Jorah steps up and totally owns the ring before introducing his gift for her, Tyrion Lannister. Olena Tyrell tries to probe a weakness in the High Sparrow and find his hidden motives, but the man is devout and plans to punish Sir Loras for buggery and Marjorie for lying. This guy doesn't fear the powerful, which makes him dangerous. Tommen wants to bring the army down on the Sept to get Marjorie back, but Cersei talks him out of it and offers to speak with the High Sparrow on his behalf, basically in order to make sure that Marjorie is screwed. So she visits Marjorie in captivity to basically laugh in her face, but the joke's on her too, because although Cersei thinks she's in control of the situation, the High Sparrow has been listening to all of the incest confessions he's been hearing from the now devout Lancel Lannister. So even the Queen Regent is imprisoned and thrown into a cell, and it turns out this ragtag holy man is a real power player after all. Princess Marcella visits her uncle daddy to explain that she's all grown up and doesn't want to leave Dawn, while Bronn realises that the Sand Snakes know a thing or two about poison, and they even get their tits out for a bit, in an attempt to make this storyline interesting. So Tyrion's introduced to Danny and they test each other's worth before she once again banishes Ser Jorah from Marine. He can't remain by her side, but also she shouldn't kill him just for being so loyal. See ya! So they talk about their respective fathers and Danny takes Tyrion on as an advisor due to his intelligence and sheer experience. While Ser Jorah goes back into the fighting slave pits because plan to see Danny again? Cersei is having a miserable time in her cell and encouraged to confess her sins by Sister Frumpy. Kyburn is allowed to visit, but it's not looking good for her in her upcoming trial by the Faith, so she's kept awake and mistreated until she admits her sins. Arya has assumed the identity of a clam seller in order to report back on all that she's seen in Braavos for Jack and Hagar, and she comes across a crooked insurance seller who becomes her assassination target. Her acolyte bully, the Waif, doesn't think she's ready however and wants to see her fail. Sansa tells Reek she hates him for killing her family and Reek knows he deserves it, but he admits that he never found or killed Bran and Rickon when they ran away, and Ramsay Bolton wants to take a small hit squad out in order to attack Stannis instead of hiding behind the walls of Winterfell. Jon and the Watch are led by Tormund to Hardholm, a bay north of a wall where thousands of wildlings have settled as the leftovers of Mance Raider's army. It's hard to get them to do anything, but Tormund helps with the negotiations, and Jon explains that this isn't about making friends, but surviving south of a wall and fighting off the undead instead of remaining in the north to join their ranks. Some agree to board for ships, but it's already too late. The thunder and the cold roll down from the top of the mountains, and the distant screams begin. Wildlings flee into the stronghold and seal the gates to a sudden creepy silence. The dead have come and the wildlings must watch and hold the gates together against a tide of whites whilst they evacuate to the ships. The others watch down from on high whilst Jon makes a move to recover a cache of dragonglass, while a giant stamps out the dead like ants. A white walker steps down to intervene, killing a fen like it's nothing and throwing Jon like a ragdoll. They can shatter steel swords with a touch, but Jon has the Valerian steel blade that Commander Mormont gave him back in Season 1. But this small victory gains the attention of the Night King. So horrible undead children attack the living along with a tide of even more corpses that pour themselves into the slaughter. The walls can't hold and the last of the survivors barely make their escape to the sea in the last boat, with a giant holding defence. The dead simply stare out across the water at the living, while the Night King displays his power and reanimates all of the murdered wildlings as corpse soldiers to swell his ranks. So things didn't quite go as planned, so John arrives back with those that did make it and for a moment it looks like Sir Alistair the fawn isn't going to let them in. Jon has saved lives, but the Watch is not happy to see their enemy passing through. Stannis is still snowed in on a march and Ramsay's strike force manages to burn all of their supplies before disappearing. The morale is low, so he sends Sir Davos back to the wall in order to get him out of the way for what happens next. Stannis spends some quality time with his daughter before consenting to have Melisandre burn her alive! His creepy wife finally seems to realise she's made a mistake, and everybody watches on as Shireen is sacrificed in order to lift for heavy snows. 
best dad ever. In Dawn, Jamie meets with Prince Duran, and it's clear that the Sand Snakes are behind the real threat to Marcella's life, so they're all allowed to return home along with the princess. Undercover Arya forgets about her assassination mission when she spots Lord Tyrell as he goes to meet the Iron Bank, and more importantly, Sir Merin Trant, who's also named on her list for killing her swordmaster, Sirio Pharrell. So she follows him to a brothel where it turns out that Sir Merin likes his girls to be children. It's Danny's wedding day to the noble Hisdar and the fighting pits are reopened to please the people and help secure her rule, despite it leaving a foul taste in everyone's mouth. Despite the ban, Sir Jorah is back again to get Danny's attention and she can't help but care about his survival. But then at the last moment he saves Danny from an assassin's knife and suddenly the celebrations turn to chaos and massacre as the sons of the harpy make their final surprise assault. Jorah, Dario and the Unsullied protect their queen but they're trapped and surrounded. It looks like the end until down swoops Drogon on, the dragon that she never managed to capture. He burns and eats her enemies, but is wild and fierce as well. However, Danny, for the first time in a long time, knows what she must do, and mounts her dragon that flies her right out of the city. So I guess you lot are in charge? So the sacrifice worked and the snows have melted, allowing the world's best dad Stannis to attack Winterfell. But it turns out that burning your daughter alive sends a bad message, and half his men have deserted in the night with all of their horse. And bad becomes worse, because Stannis' wife has also hung herself in her grief. Melisandre realises that now is probably a good time to leave, and Stannis marches on regardless, leading a demoralised force on foot. He still thinks it's going to be a siege, but with his weakened army less of a threat, Dreadfort men ride out from Winterfell on horse and cut through Stannis's army. Brienne and Podrick watch the whole situation unravel, as Stannis is one of the last men left alive out of sheer stubborn will. The Lady of Tarf takes a moment to accuse Stannis of murdering his brother, Good King Renly, with blood magic, and Stannis, with nothing left, admits to the truth of it and tells Brienne to do her duty. Ramsay mops up the last of the men in the slaughter. Meanwhile in Winterfell, Sansa escapes her room, just in time for a bit of the old Fionn to shine, and throw Ramsay's psycho girlfriend off a wall. With the victorious Boltons returning, they make for the biggest looking pile of snow they can find, and Felma and Louise themselves to escape. Over in Braavos, Sir Merin Trant is shagging and beating children to pass the time. But one of them turns out to be Arya, who takes his eyes before stabbing him up and crossing another name off her list. This however was off the books, and not part of her orders. So the faceless men teach her a lesson or two about what it truly is to be no one when taking a face, and leave her blinded. Jamie and Bronn are finally set to leave Dawn with Marcella under Duran Martell's watchful eye, and although Marcella has a moment to confess that she always knew that Jamie was her true father, and that she was cool with it, she has in fact been poisoned by a deadly sand snake kiss. Over in Marine, with Danny gone, the party is over, so Tyrion, Jorah and Dario try to work out what they're supposed to do. The game plan is that Dario and Sir Jorah will go and search for Danny out in the grass sea back where Drogon was last seen heading, while Tyrion proves his worth by helping Grey Worm and Missandre to rule in her absence, and Varys turns up again in order to help out. Meanwhile, Drogon has taken Danny to God knows where in order to lick his wounds and recover from the spears and arrows that he took in the fighting pit. So Danny goes off to look for some food, but she finds herself captured instead by a Dothraki Kalasar that's almost as big as Khal Drogo's was back in the day. Back in King's Landing, Cersei's spirit is finally broken by the endless nagging, and she confesses her sin to the High Sparrow, including banging her cousin Lancel, but keeping quiet about Jaime and her incest children. So she's permitted to return to the Red Keep while she waits for her religious trial, but not before her atonement. The sisters scrub her down, cut away her hair, and then force her to march naked all the way back through the city as a walk of atonement. What a shame. The peasant common folk take this as a nice opportunity to hurl abuse and throw filth at her, and basically degrade her as much as possible. And by the time she reaches the Red Keep, she's bleeding and in tears. But her resolve returns as Kyburn introduces her to his creation, the newest member of the Kingsguard. Jon knows that he's the most hated man in Castle Black for saving wildlings, and Sam asks to be sent to Old Town with Gilly in order to become a maester to replace Aemon. And Jon consents because they need all the knowledge that they can in order to fight this ancient evil. And Melisandre returns with her tail between her legs, and Davos is distraught to learn of the loss of his king. That night, Jon pays the price for being so blind to the disquiet among his own men. Alistair Fawn and even his own steward lure him into the courtyard to name him a traitor, and each take turns in stabbing him for the sake of the watch. All of Jon's efforts turn to ashes as he's left in the snow to die. Oh my god. 
So Sansa and Reek are dead or alive in their escape from the Boltons, while Tyrion is trying to help rule Marine with Danny's old crew, while she herself is captured by a Dothraki horde. Bran's not even been in this season, so he's probably still learning tree magic, while Cersei has been knocked down a peg or two by a religious man that she helped rise to power as part of her scheming. And despite doing his best to help the realms of men against the power of the White Walkers by saving the living, Lord Commander Snow has been stabbed to death by his own brothers of the Watch. So this is the last season that keeps vaguely in line with the books before the next one reaches ahead and does its own thing. So thank you so much for watching guys, and I really hope you enjoyed having Game of Thrones Season 5 crammed inside of you. These are of course the full on cramps that skip nothing in order to give you the fullest possible picture. And it really helps me out if you give this video a like and click that subscribe button. And thanks for all the comments by the way, you guys really are the best. Take care.